Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Christopher Sands, and I'm director of the Canada Institute here at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. And we're particularly pleased today to have a discussion of um, foreign policy, trade policy for the middle class. And this discussion is nothing really to do with me. I just happen to be the guy who gets to do the introduction. It is something that has been brought together by our Wilson Center fellow, Jeff Cusick. Um, Dr. Cusick is a fellow uh, here, uh, one of the Woodrow Wilson's best fellowships. Um, he has previously been a fellow at the Udall Center at the University of Arizona, the Nyhaus Center at Princeton, University College London, and City College of New York. Uh, his specialty, uh, very appropriate for today's topic, is po the politics of international trade and investment. And with that, let me hand it over to Jeff to introduce the program formally. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, everyone, for coming today, and especially thank you to folks who are joining us online. Um, we're excited to have a conversation about trade policy reform at a time when it's, I think, really clear to all of us how much stability or lack thereof in the global marketplace matters for our local communities and our everyday politics. So everything from gas prices to inflation to even holiday shopping habits are all things that are directly related to trade. Now for the United States, as one of the country's largest traders by, by value and by volume, uh, America's always had a complex relationship with globalization. There's been a debate in this country for many years about whether trade is good for jobs, whether trade is good for wages, what trade's environmental impacts might be. Lots of these questions have been swirling around in the back of American politics for a long time, but recent events especially the 2016 election, really brought some of these questions to the forefront of, of policy conversations in, in this country. So the rise of kind of populist, anti-globalist sentiment on both sides of the aisle has caused a lot of folks to rethink what the U.S. approach to globalization ought to really look like in terms of day-to-day -day policy decisions. What do we do with the winners and indeed with the losers from free trade and globalization? In response to some of these questions being raised, there's been a growing consensus among economists, lawyers, political scientists, and policymakers that we need a more sustainable, a more inclusive set of trade policies. And that doesn't just mean rewriting international trade rules, it also means something about what we're going to do in terms of domestic policies. Are we dev uh, devising sufficient domestic transfers? Are there sufficient social safety nets put in place to catch those who fall from, from globalization? What are we going to do with communities that are being left behind, especially if we're thinking about certain underrepresented minorities and specific industries that have been uh, particularly impacted by globalization? So all these questions are relevant right now in American politics, and with that in mind, um, we recently ran a survey of average Americans asking folks how they felt about socially inclusive trade policies. That report is just going up on our website today, so I hope you, uh, if you're interested in this topic, uh, take a chance to download that report and look through the survey results. There are a couple of interesting findings there. One is that there's very robust support among average Americans for doing something about trade, for thinking about what's more inclusive, for thinking about what's more sustainable, for trying to implement a worker-centric trade policy. On the other hand, the survey also finds that attitudes are highly partisan, which I think is unsurprising in a polarized United States. But what it means is that common grievances have not produced shared policy preferences. Lots of people are upset about their economic status or disillusioned in, to some extent with globalization, but there are deep disagreements among US voters on how to fix this problem, how they perceive the problem, what to do about trade policy. So with that in mind, it's our privilege to welcome a number of folks who are some of the leading thinkers and researchers in this area, and someone, Elizabeth Baltzon, who is one of the key figures in policy making, currently at United States uh, off, uh, Trade Representative. She is senior advisor to the USTR and Ambassador Catherine Tai. 
and she has been a trade lawyer for several decades, previously having been an attorney at USTR, having investigated banking practices as part of the Senate Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations, having been Democratic counsel to the House Ways and Means Committee, and previously having been a fellow at the Open Markets Institute. And a theme of her career is thinking about what's a sustainable, inclusive economic policy, both at home and abroad. What does that really look like? How do we implement it? And how can we make these, these ideas really work? So please uh, join me in welcoming Beth to the microphone to update us on USTR's cor current priorities and efforts in this area. Thank you so much. Um, thanks to the Wilson Center and specifically the Canada Institute for inviting me to join this terrific group to talk about trade policy under the Biden-Harris administration. Jeff and I have known each other for many years now and I appreciate his thoughtful, empirical approach to understanding how to make trade work better for all. I myself have roots in Canada, Saskatchewan to be specific, so it's a particular pleasure to be here where the temperature is comparatively balmy. <laughs> President Biden is committed to growing the economy from the bottom up and the middle out. That's true not only for our domestic economic policy, but for our foreign economic policy. The President's trade agenda reflects the administration's commitment to ensuring that trade is aligned with the goal of a foreign policy for the middle class. In that vein, before we talk about trade, let's start by looking at some of the important aspects of the President's domestic economic agenda. Let's start with labor. President Biden has said that the middle class built this country and unions built the middle class. Under his leadership, we're seeing a surge in organizing and the highest support for labor unions since 1965. The environment. He understands the urgency of protecting our planet, including by addressing the climate crisis. On day one, he committed the United States to rejoining the Paris Agreement. His embrace of green industrial policy has seen the United States vault into a leadership role in green tech and renewables. Competition. The president is focused on competition. In his words, capitalism without competition isn't capitalism, it's exploitation. His executive order on competition emphasizes the importance of fair competition and recognizes the threats of excessive concentration to, quote, basic economic liberties, democratic accountability, and the welfare of workers, farmers, small businesses, startups, and consumers. Equity and inclusion. The president also understands how critical it is for the economy to be inclusive. On day one, he recognized the importance of intentionality in advancing equity in federal policy in order to ensure that underserved and marginalized communities have a better, an equal shot at the American dream. Using the power of the federal government to be a convening force for good in designing policy and outcomes that contribute to our collective resiliency, prosperity, and competitiveness is a core component of the administration's mission. So let's talk about how trade fits in. In years past, trade policy hasn't necessarily been connected to domestic initiatives. Not so under this administration. Under the leadership of Ambassador Tai, the president's pro-labor, pro-environment, pro-competition, pro-equity agenda is central to the administration's trade policy too. This is the heart of the worker-centered trade policy that was outlined in the president's trade agenda in March of this year. To understand the shift in thinking about trade and ec economic governance more generally, it's useful to provide some context. When the contemporary global trading system was created in the 90s, the prevailing thinking was a modern take on laissez-faire economics, referred to by its critics as trickle-down economics. Roughly speaking, under this approach, the private sector's better than the government at making decisions that result in an efficient allocation of resources when it comes to investment and production. As the thinking went over time through this focus on maximized efficiency outcomes, the gains would be spread throughout society and a rising tide would lift all boats. 
wages and labor standards would rise, as would environmental protections. Thus, trade rules were oriented toward disciplining government behavior. This approach stands in contrast to the original Bretton Woods vision for the global trading system. That system recognized that the private sector, in its quest to maximize profits, might, in the context of a liberalizing global economy, engage in arbitrage that would be harmful to working people and the planet. Thus, at the request of the Global South, the original set of trade rules, which included but wasn't limited to what became the GATT, also included enforceable labor rules. It included competition rules as well. And forward thinking for that time, it had exemptions for conservation agreements. But these rules never entered into force. Nevertheless, the labor and competition elements of those rules reflect the views of Adam Smith himself, who was first and foremost an anti-monopolist. His concern about tariffs related, in the, in, related to the ways in which those tariffs were used in 18th century England to prop up monopolies. Smith saw monopoly rents as harmful to the working class and identified wage suppression as a systemic problem. But he also warned that tariff liberalization itself could lead to monopolization and urged governments to be mindful of the risks. These principles weren't reflected in the system we implemented in the 90s, however. And much of what, we can, be, uh, much of what can be seen as a backlash against globalization is understandable when seen through this broader economic lens. The ability to engage in arbitrage has, as the architects of Bretton Woods anticipated, contributed to a race to the bottom. A rising tide hasn't lifted all boats, as we have seen income equality grow within countries. In fact, even the reduction in inequality across countries is, according to the World Bank, being reversed as a result of the pandemic. This result, not surprisingly, erodes support for the global version of globalization that got us here. Jobs matter. The State Department in 1945 wisely recognized that high employment was a precursor to the ability of governments to liberalize trade, rather than a consequence of liberalized trade. John Maynard Keynes praised the original U.S. vision for post-war trade as providing safeguards against, quote, the disastrous consequences of a laissez-faire system. The pandemic and Russia's invasion of Ukraine have further exposed flaws in the system, product shortages, and an overall recognition that the private sector hadn't done enough to fast factor risk into its supply chain decisions has led to a greater willingness to ask whether we need a new version of globalization, one that is more resilient. One of the first things Ambassador Tai did when she came back to USTR was to ask the International Trade Commission to study the distributional effects of US trade and trade policy on workers. The ITC released its report on November 14th. As an overarching matter, the report highlighted the need for better data, especially disaggregated data, in order to fill the gaps and give a more fulsome picture of the distributional effects. But it also does clearly illustrate the significant adverse effects of job losses due to goods imports, specifically from China. Manufacturing jobs in particular took a big hit. It also illustrates that the neoclassical model assumption that labor is mobile turned out to be wrong. Labor is sticky. And some of the literature indicates that non-white workers experienced disproportionately negative effects with respect to import competition. For many years, the conversation on trade has focused on the net benefits at an aggregate level. But looking at aggregate data makes it too easy to gloss over the very real devastating consequences concentrated in certain communities. It's no surprise that disaffected workers and their broader communities have doubts about whether the rules of globalization work for them. If trickle-down economics doesn't work for our domestic economy, then it won't work for our trade policy either. The problem isn't with globalization itself, but with the rules that govern globalization. The thinking that underpinned the original Bretton Woods vision demonstrates that governments have choices in the kind of globalization they embrace. We can choose rules that promote a more equitable, sustainable global economy, both across borders and within borders. We can also choose rules that do a better job of incentivizing resiliency. The focus on efficiency 
which is really a euphemism for the lowest possible cost, is precisely what facilitates the kind of arbitrage that puts downward pressure on labor and environmental regulation and enforcement, so that there is a link between a resilient system and an inclusive system. We have to be mindful of all the nooks and crannies of our trade policy that reflect this efficiency mindset, including the opaque but critical industrial rules of origin in our trade agreements. The antitrust community is similarly rethinking the narrow lens focused on efficiency that has guided federal antitrust enforcement in past decades. This is just another way we see alignment between our approach to domestic economic issues and our approach to foreign economic issues. The Biden-Harris administration is working with our allies and partners to execute this more equitable trade policy. Some examples. The Trade and Technology Council. The United States and the EU have worked hard to resolve long-standing irritants, such as large civil aircraft. The Russian invasion of Ukraine has only highlighted the importance of the EU-US alliance. The TTC is a mechanism that allows the US and the EU to cooperate on a range of issues, from forced labor, to climate, to supply chains. The TTC also has a working group that's looking at the power of online platforms to ensure effective competition and contestable markets. Of note as well is the creation of the transatlantic trade and labor dialogue, providing a mechanism for a tripartite conversation about challenges facing workers in the global economy. The global arrangement. Speaking of resolving irritants, the United States and the EU have worked together to develop the global arrangement to address global steel and aluminum excess capacity and the serious threat market distortions in those sectors pose to workers, producers, and the climate. The Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. The United States and critical partners in the Indo-Pacific are working together to advance trade relations that promote resilience, inclusion, and sustainability. Areas under discussion include labor, the environment, competition policy, and equity. The U.S.-Taiwan Initiative on 21st Century Trade. This initiative will include labor, the environment, and small and medium-sized enterprises, including SMEs owned by underrepresented groups and women entrepreneurs, and those in disadvantaged communities. The Strategic Trade and Investment Partnership with Kenya. These negotiations will focus on enhancing engagement with a view to increasing investment, promoting sustainable and inclusive economic growth, benefiting workers, consumers, and businesses, and supporting African regional economic integration. There will be special emphases on micro, small, and medium enterprises, and women, youth, persons with disabilities, and other vulnerable groups. The America's Partnership for Economic Prosperity. The United States already has many trade agreements with our neighbors to the South, but APAP reflects the importance of continuing to work with allies and partners in our own hemisphere. Still in its early stages, one of the goals of APAP is to ensure sustainable and inclusive trade. And I would be remiss if I didn't recognize the ongoing strong partnership we have with Canada. Just last week, Ambassador Tai and Minister Eng recognized the close relationship and emphasized the importance of U.S.-Canadian cooperation. Notably, these initiatives don't reflect a cookie-cutter approach. We have different partners who have different priorities, but the United States is leading this effort to figure out the best approaches to design trade that contributes to our collective resiliency. This is a time of change. Change can be hard. We're accustomed to certain ways of doing things, and the prospect of doing things differently can be daunting. But there is a real opportunity here to work together to foster a global economy that is more resilient, more sustainable, and more just. Thank you so much, Beth. Uh, a lot of interesting things to unpack there to get us started thinking about how we take these kind of big ideas and start considering ways in which we can actually implement policies on the ground and, and uh, Senior Advisor Baltzan just gave us a couple of specific examples of what is currently going on right now or other efforts that are in the works. A couple of things that are so interesting about what we just heard, I think, is that thinking about inclusive trade policy is not an entirely new idea. And there were two 
compelling references to history there. I always teach my students in, in political economy classes that Adam Smith is wrongly remembered as an advocate of unfettered capitalism, but actually did recognize that the private market had limits and it would underprovide public goods, uh, including raising certain questions about worker welfare and even things like public health and the environment. So I appreciate you drawing attention to that. And then also this idea that new, uh, this idea that New Deal era, uh, 1940s uh, trade policy understood that globalization or what would become globalization as we refer to it today was supposed to serve workers and, and not the other way around. And perhaps something has been lost along the way in terms of that, in terms of that thinking. So I think what we recognize today and what we just heard uh, Beth refer to is that trade policy alone can't do everything. There has to be a closer marriage between foreign policy initiatives and domestic policy efforts. And with that in mind, we're gonna turn now to a panel discussion uh, with three people who've thought a lot about a lot about these issues in in recent years, I'm going to introduce them to you now. We're going to hear from each one of them in in turn, and then open things up for a Q and A. Um, so please make note of uh, any questions that are occurring to you at this stage. And for the folks who are following us online, please feel free to type any questions you might have into the the chat box that's available to you on the website. So uh, as you see us from your left to right. Professor Gregory Schaefer is a professor of law at the University of California, Irvine. Uh, he's written extensively on economic policy and, and rules generally, but specifically on trade policy. And I would encourage everyone to seek out a really foundational article of his on this topic called uh, Retooling Trade Agreements for Social Inclusion. Uh, Todd Tucker is the Director of Industrial Policy and Trade at the Roosevelt Institute. Uh, his current priorities include thinking about what a progressive industrial policy might look like. And in particular, he's done a lot of detailed research and thinking about environmental issues as they relate to trade, again, both as a domestic and an international policy concern. And Kathleen Clausen is a professor of law, formerly of USTR herself. Uh, professor of Law at Georgetown University, and she has thought carefully and done some uh, research I encourage you to look at on trade's relationship to not just issues like national security, but of course, labor specifically. So we'll hear from each of them. Please, as I mentioned, uh, take note of, of any questions that, that might be occurring to you as we hear from our speakers. Greg, we'll start with you, please. Great. Thank you so much, Jeff, um, and thanks so much to Beth. I mean, Beth has been at the forefront of rethinking these issues, both outside of government and inside of government, and it's a real challenge for us because government's not going to be able to do this alone, right? This is something reframing how we think about trade, the regulation of trade, given the major challenges we have today from climate change, um, from the challenges of imploding so in societies because of the lack of social inclusion, and, and then the challenge for us all is respect to our relationship with China, um, which goes under the name of resilience. How do we have resilient trade uh, given the geopolitical tensions that exist today? So how do we address these challenges and how do we put them within agreements? Because this is really a, a very different way of, of thinking about uh, trade negotiations and international treaties than we saw since the 1990s with the rise of NAFTA and, and the World Trade Organization. The, um, the problem really, I think, is twofold, thinking about the major problems we face. One is the crisis of multilateralism. We see this within the World Trade Organization, but we see this in other in international institutions. Um, if we do not have international institutions, we are more likely to have conflict, and that conflict, as we saw, during, can lead to war in terms of our earlier history, in turn to history. And so how do we create rules of the game through which we can organize relationships and provide some sort of certainty and predictability for traders, but also in terms of interstate relations, and ultimately affecting sort of the, the health of our societies. And that involves, as Beth said, the regulation of trade, not simply the liberalization of trade. 
The second is we see this with respect to the, ta the attack of the Capitol here just, what, a couple of years ago on January 6th. We have real challenges. You see decline of rule of law indicators around the world. You see them declining in China. You see them declining in Russia. You see them declining in transitional countries. And you see them declining in full-fledged democracies, including this country, in terms of basic rule of law norms. So if we, th but these are intermeshed. Right? We are going to see decline of, of insta basic international institutions pro that provide the framework for global cooperation if we have imploding societies. Um, and so we have to rethink about trade agreements to, to support healthy societies as opposed to, to contributing to rising inequality, which, of course, people talk about. Uh, that we see levels of inequality in the United States we haven't seen since the 1930s, such that you know, one percent of the population control forty percent of of wealth, which is more than the bottom ninety percent of our population. That simply is unsustainable, and trade has contributed to this because trade liberalization has enhanced the rel relative power of capital vis-a-vis -vis labor. So trade can't be th thought about in trade negotiations simply about interstate relations: U.S. China, U.S. Europe, U.S. Brazil, U.S. India. It also has to be thought about in terms of the relationship between capital and labor globally and within our own countries. And so when capital is able to freely invest and tell labor that we will simply move abroad if we, uh, if you don't, uh, you know, if you demand higher wage rates, if you demand sort of different types of labor conditions, then uh, labor has, is dispersed and it has very little, it's sort where of bargaining power is, is, uh, is undermined. And so international trade agreements creating the framework of this form of global capitalism, which goes has gone under the name of neoliberalism, has contributed to what we see today. It's not the only uh, uh, contributor. We see changes in technology mm -hmm. that have, have assisted in the offshoring of tasks and what are we call global supply chains today. But of course, firms have incentives when they use technology as well to redisplace workers. Um, and so we really need to think about how do we govern technology, how do we govern trade, so that we have a much more socially inclusive, healthy society. The traditional way of thinking about this was a two-step. That is, you'd have trade liberalization, reducing tariffs, squeezing the last cent of uh, efficiency through global commitments, binding commitments through treaties, and then you would take care of the issues of distribution of the benefits of trade nationally through national regulation. That's the way I was taught trade. That's, it was the, that's the way you see all case books uh, that I have taught um, uh, trade. They start off with sort of this basic, basic uh, paradigm. But of course, especially within the United States, we've seen that this simply hasn't happened, that we saw trade liberalization on the one hand, but we did not see redistributive policy on the other. We saw ra rather, rather tax cuts on the wealthy, the elimination of uh, of estate taxes, you know, or, or the curtailment of them, and so forth. And so we have to really think about, I think, uh, trade agreements in a much broader way than we ever did before. One, we need to think about the interrelationship of trade and tax, because as, as capital has become much more sort of uh, free in terms of using accounting to, to go offshore, to evade taxes, and so forth, this erodes the ability of the, of the state to be able to provide basic redistributive and social welfare services, uh, job retraining programs, and so forth. So we need to think about tax and trade in, in, uh, in combination. We also need to think about uh, job retraining as part of active labor policies. Um, if we have trade liberalization without those, we will see people being left behind, is what we've seen in this country. Um, and if we simply go forward with more and more trade liberalization but don't follow up with domestic social policies, then we will see so erosion of basic so the social, basic social peace, which we're seeing in this country today. And so trade liberalization should be contingent on providing these basic uh, you know, social protections. Um, we should we need to also create disincentives through not only national policy but international policy, which permits for what I would what I'm going to speak to briefly, but as, as a centerpiece of my article is the challenges of social dumping. 
When I think about social dumping, and that is the importing of, of products and the consumption of products in violation of core fundamental labor rights, I think of this not in terms of we're go out as missionaries and try to change the world so that we protect labor rights and workers abroad. I mean, I've seen the United States often act as a missionary and with very drastic consequences. I rather think in terms of two things. One is we do not want to be complicit through our purchasing power in the violation of labor rights. So that is very much a domestic uh, policy matter. And second, that these these uh, the importation, uh, our complicity in, in importing these products and consuming them actually undermines the social bargain between the working class, the middle class, um, and capital here at home. And so that's bec that's and that threatens our, our our democracy. And so there's a reason then to have uh, uh, to disincentivize social dumping and to come up with how do we do this through law. Um, so I'll just say uh, the logic of labor provisions is not just about human rights the way we think about human rights traditionally because human rights is really sort of a focus on the relationship between the individual and the state. Labor rights are about the relationship of, of workers with capital. What sort of bargaining power they have? Do that? What sort of rights to association do they have? What sort of collective bargaining rights do they have? Um, and as I said, those have been undermined through economic globalization if we don't regulate it with respect to labor rights. And so you saw with the USMCA sort of a, 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 an innovation with the rapid response mechanism that maybe Kathleen will speak more about, I'm not quite sure, um, but providing the direct ability to petition uh, to, for the U.S. to suspend duties for plants, in, in particular U.S. plants based in Mexico, which do not provide for collective bargaining rights to their workers. And the, the threat of these, uh, with the, the beauty of this mechanism is that, one, trade is being used to enhance dialogue and empower workers. That creates it, and all of those cases have been settled. And they've been settled in ways that have permitted workers to engage in collective bargaining rights. And there are people within Mexico who are certainly very favorable to this because it enhances their bargaining power within their own state. Um, I think we can, th I could talk about more of this, but I'm running out of time. But I think we can think about social dumping um, and thinking about our own dumping laws to focus not simply on, on the uh, sort of the manipulation of accounting rules, in my view, that we see now, um, but rather really focusing on labor. So the focus of the, of the settlements will be on enhancing labor rights. And so I'll end there. Thanks so much, Greg. I, I really appreciate that. Some really fundamental questions raised I think by those by those insights, you mentioned, for example, rethinking trade policy's relationship to tax policy or giving it deeper consideration. And I think that's key nowadays after we've seen decades of capital controls dismantled around the world in an effort to kind of grease the wheels of doing trade. We've seen a, a divorce, I think, between uh, what trade agreements are trying to do in, in just promotion of the flow of goods and services around the world and perhaps sacrificing a careful attention to, to something like tax, tax rates, corporate tax rates in, in particular. You also touch on something I think that's very fundamental in trade law right now, which is it seems to me we're exposed to competing incentives. On the one hand, I think a lot of us would love to say we just need much stricter, tighter, more enforceable rules relating to things like taxes, worker rights, or indeed the environment. And yet on the other hand, we see calls for greater flexibility in trade law. And we've also seen, as you mentioned, trade disputes, a lot of disagreement over whether domestic regulations are tantamount to discriminatory behavior. So doing something like having a minimum wage rule built into your trade deal or having something like uh, environmental standards that regulate production processes. These are things over which there's been a lot of litigation, which means it's not that easy for countries to defend their domestic interests in ways they might like to. So having, having raised that difficult question or, or issue to which there's, there's no clean answer, uh, perhaps, uh, we'll turn to Todd Tucker, who has actually thought in great detail about some of these environmental implications and some of where these, these tensions between what's kind of best for the market and what's best for regulating the environment and sustainability, where those, where those tensions exist and, and how they might be resolved. Todd? Uh, 
uh, thanks, Jeff, and uh, lovely to be on this panel uh, and at this conference. Uh, it's such a, a sign of the times that we're having a session dedicated to uh, whether, whether and how trade can uh, serve the interest of the middle and working class. Uh, and that's, uh, that's certainly, I think, just one example of some of the transitions that we've seen uh, in recent years in the trade policy space. Um, you know, I think in the years ahead, we will have a test as to whether uh, trade can, can help not hinder um, the very dramatic economic transformation uh, that, the, that the climate crisis requires. Uh, and in particular, if it can do so in a way that, uh, that is supportive of some basic tenets of democracy, uh, because we certainly know that there's an authoritarian way to do economic transition uh, and whether democracies can be uh, at least roughly as effective uh, as the authoritarian version, I think, is a test that we'll really be living for the rest of our lives, uh, but certainly over the next decade. Um, you know, I, I think one of the, you know, hearing Beth talk about the transitions and the, the changes in the Biden administration's approach to trade, I think it's just kind of worth um, you know, punching a little, punching a little bit uh, to kind of demonstrate some of the ways that this that this transition has happened and so the, the, the transition in thinking. Uh, you know, over say, you know, relative to 2008, 2009, 2010, uh, to sort of what's happened sort of post 2016. I think that there's some interesting comparisons. You know, one uh, on the I'll kind of mix some domestic and international examples, but uh, you know, one uh, with you know Obama came into office, the Obama administration came into office. Uh, facing a major recession uh, and had the choice about how much to stimulate the economy uh, and, and was really eager to not hit the T word, the trillion. Uh, and, and that sort of arithmetic guided a lot of the thinking as to how big to go. Uh, fast forward to the Biden administration, uh, there's a concern about doing too little, not doing too much. Uh, and uh, I think as a result, you know, years of recovery that it took under the Obama administration versus, you know, months uh, in the Biden administration, I think is a sign of, uh, of ways that the U.S. is perhaps, uh, you know, despite maybe some of the rhetoric in trade circles, is actually demonstrating uh, actually more credibility with this, with this pivot sort of away from neoliberalism rather than less. Um, you know, we, we had the Obama administration attempt to pass the Waxman-Markey uh, legislation that sort of used... Uh, a combination of carrots and sticks, but largely uh, sticks uh, as the as the way to think about uh, dealing with a climate crisis uh, that got stuck in the Senate. Fast forward to today, you have an industrial policy and carrots focused approach through the Inflation Reduction Act that, for the first time in history, had the U.S. actually pass major uh, climate legislation in a 50-50 Senate. Um, you know, you had, uh, again, sort of in 2010, you had, uh, as Europe was trying to move forward aggressively uh, far ahead of the U.S. on climate action uh, with things like extending their emissions trading scheme to the aviation sector, um, you had the Obama administration and, and both parties in Congress work to water that down and work to exempt U.S. exporters uh, from, uh, from that scheme thereby undermining you know the the efficacy of the of the european taking that sort of leading action fast forward to today you have the european union contemplating and imposing a carbon border adjustment mechanism uh and uh not only is the u.s not complaining about it uh, or at least not very vocally uh but are, are proposing ways that the two systems might cooperate uh, uh, more effectively than they have in the past through things like, as Beth mentioned, the global arrangement uh, on sustainable steel and aluminum. Um, and I think that's just kind of worth underlining that, you know, it's not the norm in Washington that you have uh, an administration that's not focused first when it comes to trade policy on exporter interest. Um, I think thinking uh, through allow, allowing both sides to have some policy space to pursue climate solutions in the way that makes sense for their political economy uh, is, is a really important advancement. Um, you know, you had from, you know, maybe 2008 to, uh, to uh, 2020, you had every week was being infrastructure week. Uh, it was always going to be the next week was when we're going to make this big infrastructure investment. Now you have the, uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law that's actually rebuilding America in a substantial way and doing so in a climate, a more climate friendly way than in the past. You had uh, the U.S. staking all of its credibility in the Asia Pacific with passing uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership and repeatedly failing to sort of get the level of support in Congress that would be required to get it over the line. So 
building up the importance of this credibility uh, uh, enhancing step, supposedly, uh, but then ultimately being able to deliver versus now, where I think you have some interesting new frameworks with the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework uh, and the transatlantic space as well, um, where, you know, you know, that I think are possible, would, are conceivable, it's conceivable they could attract actually more support and get over the finish line, and not just in one one single undertaking, but actually in a series of undertakings on different issues with different uh, countries. Uh, some would say that's a weakness. I actually think it's a strength, especially to the extent that repeated action shows credibility. Um, so, uh, you know, more to be seen in terms of, of what actually happens there. And then I think finally, instead of, uh, you know, tackling competition with China by sort of loudly plan, uh, pounding your fist on the table and, and insisting that China play by the rules, um, you, have a, uh, you have an approach that's actually more l looking to, um, to find sort of ways of doing our own sort of democratic version of industrial policy uh, and, and trying to work to see how trade rules can be adapted to make that, make that possible. Um, so just to focus a little bit on, uh, before, I, before I hand over on some of, the, uh, on some of the, the, the trade issues that have come up in recent weeks, as I think the world community has kind of digested what was the approach taken in the Inflation Reduction Act, this industrial policy, carrots-focused approach, uh, and what it might mean for trade policy. Um, you know, I think it's, uh, it's caused consternation in, in, uh, uh, in European capitals. Um, but I think, again, it's kind of worth putting, uh, putting into perspective, you know, what series of actions makes the U.S. a more credible trading partner uh, versus a less credible one? Um, and I think that you're, what you're seeing with the Inflation Reduction Act is, is, is uh, you know, a recognition that given some of the threats to democracy uh, that we just heard about, um, you know, there's, there's a real threat. Uh, there's, a, there's a real threat in the U.S. that we have these very narrow windows to get policy done. Um, you have one of the major political parties uh, that is pretty steeped in election denial and climate denial. Um, and you have, you know, it's only every dozen or so years that you have unified government. So it's, you know, not surprising, uh, I think, to folks that have looked at some of the failure, failure of waxman Markey and some of the democratic stakes that we're, that we're facing that, uh, that the, the big climate action that the U.S. took, I think, was always going to look something like the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, and, and I think, that, you know, if you look at, some of the lessons from history as to why we might be thinking about uh, ensuring that there is a climate job or climate dollars in like every state and every congressional district across the country uh, is because if you look at sort of the, the, uh, the previous major uh, initiative that the U.S. undertook that was supported very consistently by both Democrats and Republicans uh, and where there could always be future appropriations for it, uh, it's really the example of the military industrial complex, uh, right, where uh, in the wake of World War II, uh, you had uh, a conscious effort on the part of defense contractors and the part of the Pentagon to ensure that defense jobs and defense dollars uh, were essentially in every congressional district and state so that you had Senate support and House support consistently for that investment. Uh, I think, you know, given sort of the election denial and the climate denial on the, on the one side of the aisle, the way to ensure that the U.S. In, is, is a consistent it doesn't, you know, it doesn't sort of roll back some of the climate progress that we're taking, uh, even in the years ahead, where it's, it's you know, the, the next few cycles are not looking particularly good for the Democratic Party. Um, it, it's going to mean that you, you want to have worker lobbyists uh, that, are, that are invested in the climate transition and have jobs to show for it uh, that, can, that can go to even a Republican-controlled Congress and say, we need to keep supporting this climate transition. Um, and so I think in the long run, that type of using public investment with a public purpose uh, to lock in some of these uh, some of these uh, economic transitions is the way that the U.S. over time shows up uh, as a as a credible partner uh, on climate. And I think that you know some of the the initiatives that, that Beth mentioned uh, are ways that we can think about how what is the trade uh, what is the trade um, layer on top of that look like. Um, you know, and, and I think that if you look at some of the things that Ambassador Tai has said or that Brian Deese from the National Economic Council or others have said, you can begin to see the emergence of something like a Biden doctrine when it comes to trade law, uh, which is basically, uh, you know, giving a, a bit of a space for a green piece uh, around, uh, around trade and subsidies, uh, you know, up until the point where there's enough of these green products and clean products on the market uh, where we're actually, where we've seen the economic transition happen. And up until then, that there's a lot of space to accommodate, uh, there, a lot of space to accommodate a buildup in both 
co- both the U.S. and Europe uh, of of these of electric vehicle industries of green hydrogen uh, of all of the rest of it. And I think that you know the global arrangement on sustainable steel and aluminum is a particularly interesting. I think test case to see sort of whether we can be creative in in problem solving in specific sectors, uh, you know, where the U.S. and Europe have probably a lot more uh, aligned in terms of their interests than they do diverging. And and I think that if, if over the next year we can see a new approach and a new set of rules to thinking creatively about market access, to thinking creatively about trade rules uh, and norms, um, that you know that could be then something that gets replicated in different sectors with different constellations of countries. Um, and so uh, with that, I'll just kind of say that I'm very excited uh, to be here on this panel with, with a, great, a great panel and with Beth and uh, look, forward, uh, look forward to your questions and discussion. Thanks so much, Todd. I, I really appreciate that. A lot of, a lot of interesting uh, ideas there. I particularly like that you mentioned how perceptions of costs and whether they're reasonable have shifted over time. So this idea that you know, uh, this fear of the T word, whether something costs a trillion dollars or indeed more is something you might have wanted to avoid in the past. And to some voters, maybe it's something you still want to avoid, but, but, but preferences are changing on that issue. When I talk about greening the economy in my classrooms and ask students what they think uh, it means and whether it's doable, uh, you often hear, well, it's bad for business because it's too expensive, and transition is costly, and it's going to take a long time, and the price tag is just too high. But I think we're seeing you know, opinions on that changing, as, as you said. Uh, one of the major issues in our minds, of course, talking about inclusive trade policy is workers, the thing we uh, have only been dancing around so far in today's uh, panel discussion, and so I'd like to now send it to Kathleen Clausen, who's going to talk to us a little bit more about where labor sits in a worker-centric policy agenda and, and what the key, key issues and challenges are. Kathleen? Great. Thank you so much, uh, Jeff. Thanks uh, for the opportunity to share the stage with uh, many from whom I regularly uh, learn and benefit. Uh, and, and also uh, great to see you, Beth, and, and so great that you could be here uh, with us today and share share your thoughts and that of the administration. Um, and that all of you uh, online and in the room uh, could break away from, of course, th- maybe the most important international event right now, the World Cup, <laughs> World Cup Games. I know we, we won't ask who everyone is rooting for. Uh, of course, we don't want to create more international controversy. We'll we'll kick that until after the panel. All right. So as I turn to the uh, labor issues in this conversation, I want to, like my colleagues, take a step back and and think about this inclusive trade journey. I really think it is a a journey, uh, a new direction in in a complicated terrain. And so a little bit of framing up front, uh, two different pathways uh, to getting to inclusive trade. And then second, I want to turn, as, as Jeff highlighted, to the, the features of the worker-centered trade policy that I think have served as guiding lights uh, in this expedition on our journey. And then last, um, I, I think the most important discussions in, in this conversation are, are not about uh, what this new direction might look like so much or even where it might take us, but rather how it happens, how we get there. What are the vehicles on this road that take us down this journey? And I think the labor vehicles, uh, as Greg alluded to, are at the cutting edge of, of how we do that. So starting with the first, the pathways that I see, I think these are two pathways at the risk of oversimplifying that many feel are fundamentally at odds with one another. They are diverging pathways. And again, uh, both Greg and, and Beth, I think, spoke to this somewhat. The first is this, we have a group of folks who, who think there's one path right, to sustainable and inclusive trade that involves trade agreements that liberalize trade and promote exports. And that, I don't think that vision has gone away for those, for that group on that path. And then at the same time, we have a separate pathway that some feel is mutually exclusive with the first, that was through the the, uh, development of domestic tools, new mechanisms, things that we don't currently have, and particularly involving the, the private sector. So those who are on path one, as I said, they find difficulty with the second path because they see it as inconsistent with trade law's fundamental core, when that's when many of them start to walk away from path two as an option at all. 
So the challenge, and I think what this administration has largely sought to achieve, what I hear from, from USTR, is to find a new path, not just one or the other, but to forge a way down a third path. And labor has been, as I said, a great case study, I think, through which to, to see this. The map that's being constructed would blend features from each path to attain the goals that frankly, both groups ultimately share. They speak in the same language about a shared destination, even if they want to get there by different routes. So in this moment, uh, what I think USTR is seeking to do and, and already uh, arguably doing is forging this new path uh, to draw from the itineraries of each of the other two, uh, the well-trodden paths that we know. So where do we see that picking and choosing? Well, we see it in the worker-centered trade policy, which I have tended to divide into three buckets workers at home, workers abroad, and workers under duress. Workers at home, workers abroad, and workers under duress. Now, when it comes to workers abroad and workers under duress, here we're talking about, of course, forced labor, I think we're reasonably well equipped with the tools that we find in path one, the traditional path, to deal with some of those issues. Right? We have trade agreements that liberalize trade and promote exports that also help to achieve goals for workers abroad that we've come a long way from the days of, of separating trade and labor, seeing them now as inextricably linked. That's captured in our, our trade agreements. We've incorporated those goals into our existing trade agreements. Uh, and so that's one thing we can take already from, from path one. And, and this administration has, has done so using those uh, agreements that are already in place. We likewise have a non, reasonably non-controversial, longstanding tools that allow us uh, to combat forced labor in supply chains, although of course, those have been enhanced of late, and I'll come to that in a moment. Where it gets trickier is when we go beyond those two buckets, or firstly, where we try to enhance what they already do. That is, we try to do more. We, we leverage beyond what we have on path one to deal with those uh, buckets, workers abroad and workers under duress. And then when we turn to the third bucket, workers at home, an effort that I think, as Beth highlighted, goes beyond the mandate of USTR and is not fully encapsulated with what we would consider to be trade policy. So it's in these contours, these that go beyond our existing uh, resources and tools, that we're starting to see the, the new path emerge. And let's call it uh, where we enter the, the buddy sphere. Uh, so sort of trying to capture what's more than just friend shoring, where we're doing friend shoring, but we're also doing friendly normative development. We're doing friend coordinated initiatives. That's just a different way of saying more cooperation. But this sort of buddy sphere seems to be this path that USTR is, is, is shaping. And there are criticisms that we haven't yet spoken about uh, today. Uh, the first, of course, is overreach, that through doing these, through trying to achieve inclusive trade in these ways, uh, we're trying to go for progressive goals that are not obtainable in the United States, and maybe that is uh, some sense of hypocrisy to it. You also hear criticisms that this is a very U.S.-centric focus, right? We only care about what we think is best for workers in each of those buckets, and we block out or don't respond to criticisms of the way the United States deals with workers at home on some of these same points. And so there is some degree of cognitive dissonance there. I think some of those criticisms are fair. We'll have to see how they continue to develop. But this brings me to the final frontier of my journey story, of this cartographic story, if you will, the means or vehicles uh, through which we get there. When we're talking about inclusive trade on labor specifically, the discourse seems to divide into two different parts again. Uh, one is workers at the table, bringing workers in at, to the table, uh, and we don't really yet know how that will change the outcomes. But second is uh, something that Greg also mentioned, holding companies accountable. And this, if I leave us with one point, would be the one that I would want to stress the most. That is, this attempt to reconcile these pathways and to forge a new direction is done largely with companies in focus. Um, on the labor side, you see this with the rapid response mechanism in the USMCA. And I'm not sure I have as rosy a view on the mechanism as Greg does, but uh, the more important point is that it is company specific, even more so it's worksite specific, right? Individual uh, factories or institutions uh, on the ground in, in Mexico. But it's not so much its novelty that matters, it's the frame. It is company specific. It is corporate accountability uh, at, at its core. We see the same with forced labor, whether in the uh, Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act or other initiatives now underway in that space, very company specific. 
I could go on about other sort of labor-related initiatives in that space, but it's not limited to labor. We see it also in environment. We've seen it in the past in environment, but now uh, even more so. And on the security side, we talk about uh, asking for further disclosures from companies either in the investment screening space when we're talking about export controls, this increased emphasis on corporate accountability all the way down across the board in our trade policy. That's a key move that is part of this recent effort uh, that the U.S. government, I think, has sought to make and which shouldn't go under noticed. When we talk about enforcement today, likewise, we're not just talking about going after bad countries, we're talking about going after bad companies. And as you can imagine, we're already starting to see a response from the private sector on this, uh, this critical move when it comes to forced labor. Just to take one example, we see increasingly businesses wondering how they can be sure that their supply chain all the way down is free of forced labor and not be subject to penalty despite their best efforts. You hear them saying, well, yes, we want workers at the table. We support those efforts, but we can't lose sight of how things uh, apply to businesses and making them unworkable. That's an ongoing challenge I think we are, we are facing. Another challenge in the journey goes back to uh, Todd's expertise, uh, which is how do we get all these other priorities in the inclusive trade story, especially environment, fit under the, the path that we wish to take? What, how, where do they appear on this map? Solar is a great example of that, right? The one that we traditionally look to where we have these environmental goals, but we know that there's a, a important uh, impacts on workers in different parts of the world. And so that is a rocky topography to be sure. So as the compass uh, comes into focus, I think it will be the implementation of these experimental tools, and I emphasize experimental, where more mapping might be required along our path. And as Beth's remarks uh, make clear, I think charting the course on this theme involves more than just geography. Thanks. Thanks so much, Kathleen. I really like this, this, this concept you introduce about uh, the buddy sphere, uh, implying that it's not just about, you know, tabulating job creation or, or, or job uh, protection or, or measuring wages or things like that, but also about stronger norms around how, how labor is, is regarded and indeed perhaps regulated. We know this has been a problem in the United States for a long time. The conversation about trade politics has in some ways always been closely related to counting up things like job loss versus job creation. So some folks might say, you know, between the year 2000 and 2020, there were four services jobs added to the U.S. economy for every manufacturing job lost. And that sounds an awful lot like positive jobs reports on balance, correct? And some people would say, well, that's comparative, uh, comparative advantage working the way that it's supposed to. And that is the global economy evolving and the U.S. economy in particular advancing. But of course, we know that we're having this conversation today because not all of those four services jobs created for each manufacturing position lost is a, is a good job, a secure job, one that provides sufficient wages or benefits. And it doesn't tell us which communities those jobs were created in and what we do with the communities who are being adversely affected. I uh, have a number of questions for the panelists, but I'd prefer to not stand in the way of, of hearing from the audience. So, uh, and let me just remind folks uh, before turning to the in-person audience, if you do have a, a question online, please do enter it uh, into the chat while we're, while we're talking. We'll have a microphone brought over. <clears throat> My name is uh, Roberta Lajou. I am a retired Mexican ambassador. And uh, I am really very impressed by the quality of this panel and the, the very serious ideas that I have just taken notes, which I have to reflect upon. What a distance are we from the time that NAFTA was called the worst trade deal ever? So that's good to hear. I, I still have two doubts, of course. Uh, relating to my own country. One is some policies, experimental or new, go to the verge of what can be called protectionism. I am referring to the auto industry and the subsidy for electric cars that both Canada and Mexico have complained about because we feel it's unfair. And the second issue regarding workers, um, I think it's very important, the initiatives that are taken 
towards Mexico, and I fully support them in terms of workers' democracy. But still, we have a question of uh, migration. I, I remember reading with a great uh, enthusiasm uh, candidate Biden's proposal for immigration reform, and I thought everything was going to be solved the moment he took office when he was elected. And yet, we still have, I don't know, 10, 12 million illegal workers. When I was in the Mexican Forest Service, we couldn't use that word, but it is illegal workers in the United States, around five or six million Mexicans. Those workers have uh, their rights, if not hindered, at least their capacities to survive on a day-to-day -day living is difficult. They might be sent back home because they commit uh, uh, a traffic uh, fault. They might not come home to see their children that night. So th that's a very important question when we're talking about human rights. Where are the human rights of this illegal workers that cannot, th the path for legalization or for transformation of their situation is not there. Thank you very much, really. I, ha I am very impressed with what I've heard today. Thank Thanks you. so much for that question. Just to punctuate that briefly, if I may, before turning to the panelists, I think there's really two core issues there, that some of the policy ideas we're talking about uh, can be perceived as or construed as trade discrimination, and, and what do we do with that? How do we protect domestic interests without without offending the sensibilities of our of our trade partners? And you know, we've been talking about things in terms of labor rights, but of course, it's not just labor rights; it's it's human rights. And we hadn't said the word immigration yet, but but immigration is a is a nice way to highlight that. Uh, labor rights are not the only kind of, of right we might be interested in. So uh, does anyone want to take a stab at either one of those those concerns? Yeah, I'm happy to start maybe on the first the first part of the question. Um, um, the and I think the, the sort of should the US subsidize the electrical ve electric vehicle industry or not? I think on some level the answer how you answer that question depends on whether you look at the scale of the economic transition that's needed, and if you believe the market will deliver that on its own, or if there needs to be some type of public policy. And I think this also gets back to the, the problem of the political credibility of the US as an actor on climate over the decades to come, and whether one thinks that uh, if the transition to electric vehicles leads to uh, even more deindustrialization of core manufacturing centers in the US like Detroit, then we're already going to see just by virtue of the technological, the, the, the labor requirements uh, of, from internal combustion engines, traditional cars versus electric vehicles, it's already a lot less. There's gonna be a lot of job loss uh, as, as that transformation happens. And so the way that uh, policymakers are thinking about limiting the extent of that job loss is through things like requiring reshoring of some of these key critical supply chains for batteries, for lithium, uh, for other inputs into the electric vehicles, just so that we can hope for a rough equilibrium between the level of employment in those sectors today versus the level of employment 10 years from now. Um, and so I think that you know one answer is and I think that there are certain folks in the environmental community and climate community for, for whom this is the answer. Uh, th this is a really big problem. We need to act very quickly. Um, we should act in whatever way leads to the quickest level of deployment of all of these technologies at the cheapest possible cost, right? That, I think that that's, uh, that's one uh, principled answer to the, to the challenge of economic transformation. That would counsel in favor of not imposing tariffs uh, on imported solar panels. That would counsel in favor of letting the market produce the electric vehicles wherever it can produce it the ch more, most cheaply. Um, I think part of the political problem there and the geopolitical problem is that if we just kind of look for the market to take action, what that's going to mean in practice is that the active industrial policies of China will be what it ultimately ends up determining what the geography of production looks like. So it's not as if we're not sort of between sort of a free market versus intervention equilibrium. We're sort of, is, is the U.S. taking on an industrial policy or are we letting sort of the U.S. 
or the Chinese industrial policy effectively determine uh, the geography of production. And I think to just kind of put this in context, you know, for all of my lifetime and all of my parents' lifetime, one of the biggest international uh, economic issues has, of course, been the rise of OPEC. Um, you know, which today controls about 40% uh, of petroleum supply uh, globally. And it ends up being something that people say wars happen over. And, you know, the, all of these massive geopolitical tensions happen over the, the, the conflict between oil consuming and oil producing countries. That's 40% that they control. So there's 60% not controlled by OPEC. Um, if you look at some of the key supply chains uh, for the electric vehicle industry and for uh, climate uh, climate product climate necessary products, you know the level of concentration is upwards of eighty percent. In some cases, more than ninety or ninety five percent in a single country. So OPEC's about a dozen countries, China's one, um, and one where there's a very complicated geopolitical relationship to begin with. So I think that if you look at sort of like what are the de- what are the, the things that the U.S. needs to do to, to ensure some domestic credibility of its climate commitments? It is things like an industrial policy for the electric vehicle industry so that you don't see um, excessive amounts of deindustrialization with this transition. And then I think it's also about the world community needing to come to some sort of view uh, as to the desirability of 90, 95 percent plus concentration in a single country. And I think that if you sort of juggle those things together, you end up, again, sort of getting something that looks a little bit like what's in the Inflation Reduction Act. Now, this is a new approach. I think it's going to take time for uh, for trading partners and, and, frankly, for U.S. agencies to digest what it means. Uh, but I think that it's not, to me, it's at least not surprising that that would be the approach that was taken. Um, so just uh, on the protectionism point and, and then briefly on the migration point, um, the 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 cha- I mean, the, there's always the risks of, of uh, to get these policies through the, through the politics, uh, domestic politics, that they're going to favor in disc- domestic industry and discriminate against others. That's the reason why we have to have, you know, international institutions and international rules to try to, and that's what we're seeing right now, sort of the dialogue that's taking place between the U.S. and Europe. Of course, Mexico and Canada benefited from the EV rules, unlike Europe and Co- South Korea. And others. Um, I'll just mention a little bit with respect to the worker, the issue of workers, because clearly, um, sort of a social dumping provisions can be used as pure protectionist mechanisms, like dumping generally. But my view is is that you would then have to think about uh, creating international institutions to constrain abuse. Uh, that's the reason why we have them. So it's not just a purely domestic issue. It's an international issue. And so that one can think about all the institutional mechanisms that we already have, um, including within the USMCA. For example, we have what are now Chapter 10. They used to be Chapter 19 panels to review any sort of import relief, um, which would inv- be binational panels. One can think about that in terms of the sort of labor provisions. And of course, one can think about international dispute settlement as well as sort of committees and monitoring, and monitoring not just between states and the way I structure this in the article that was mentioned uh, by Jeff, but also would involve like the OECD and ILO, which would bring in labor representatives as well as representatives of business would be tripartite. So one can think about mechanisms to oversee and discipline how these act are actually happening in practice. On migration, clearly, I mean, this is, it's a, uh, it's, it's shocking in terms of the way the U.S. sort of limits the rights of individual human beings who are being repressed, right, who are migrant laborers, um, illegals in particular. And, uh, and that is a domestic matter. I think that the, the one thing that the Biden administration did join, uh, was to rejoin, was the Global Migration Compact. Obviously, that's not nearly sufficient. But it's given, these are all interlinked because clearly climate change is creating all sorts of migration pressures. The sort of social implosion in countries because of political repression is creating all sorts of social migration pro, uh, migration issues. So thinking about these is in terms of a unified, uh, sort of a single cha- major challenge are all interrelated, they're all intertwined. So thank you for the question. <laughs>
And I'll just tag on to the second question as well. Um, and I, I know, uh, surely, Roberta, you, you know this, but not, maybe not everyone in the room knows about uh, this quasi-state-to-state -state case that Mexico has brought against the United States regarding discrimination of migrant workers. And there has been uh, not quite a consultations request, but an almost consultations request, at least highlighting the issue to USTR and, and DOL, uh, again, about particularly women workers uh, in these uh, vulnerable areas. Um, and that last check, which has now been quite some time ago, I think that we don't have a great deal of an update from uh, DOL primarily on uh, particularly how they're addressing this issue together with Mexico, but it certainly seems to be an ongoing discussion. And the second is something that I think you um, you highlight or, or at least imply in the question, which is how much space there is still to go, uh, that even if we can even if there will be a case regarding migrant workers under the the USMCA, what's missing still? Then maybe they don't; these tools don't go far enough. Um, you can ask whether that means that there's um, more work to be done in the absence of Congress. Um, that is to say, if IPEF or APEP uh, move forward as trade agreements without congressional approval, does that give this administration more space to try to push the envelope on issues such as those? Um, of course, it depends on our trading partners. This is not a, a one-way street, but let's say they want to take on something more related to human rights. In fact, if you look at all of the uh, discussion coming out of not just of USTR, but across uh, the Hill and the White House on trade and human rights, lately is the first time we've started to see that language come into the discussion. But we, in, a colleague and I have looked at all of the, the transcripts of uh, Senate finance hearings involving USTR, and you can see when human rights starts to become an issue. You can see when labor starts to become an issue and when gender. And so we're starting to see that human rights issue uh, come in there. But it's distinct, as Greg pointed out earlier, from labor. So how is that? Is it going to get its own sort of chapter? Will there be articles on that? I think that's still a long way, a long way away. Uh, we could say the same about gender. A gender is something we do right now through labor. Is there space for separate gender commitments that are not tied tied to labor? So I think all of that, uh, this is a long way of saying uh, all of that uh, remains on the table, and it's just a question of how much space either this administration or our trading partners uh, wish to take to address it. Thanks so much. Uh, there was a hand uh, at the outset here in the front. We'll just bring a microphone down. And just while we're waiting for the, for the microphone there, I will remind people again to download the report that the Canada Institute just put on our website today where we find that um, immigration attitudes are probably quite uh, predictably one of the most highly polarized uh, attitudes implicated under uh, foreign policy for the middle class. Please. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, the, the administration has announced this Indo-Pacific economic framework and also a, a similar one for the Western Hemisphere. Um, uh, these have been criticized as essentially a laundry list of U.S. priorities on environment, uh, corruption, labor, etc., um, while not offering anything in terms of what the, uh, the, um, the priority for these countries are, which is um, greater trade access. Uh, at the same time, um, certainly with regard to the Indo-Pacific, uh, uh, the uh, TPP is uh, uh, moving ahead without us. Um, so I guess my question is, can we uh, uh, build a global trade regime that uh, addresses the issues you are, are concerned with without a robust trade expansion uh, component? Great question, and I just uh, put a, an additional spin on that. If I may, one of the things I wanted to ask the panelists about is whether there's a tension between uh, some of the inclusive, uh, worker-centric policies we're talking about and what's best for promoting development abroad, right? Because we probably know how we can promote development quickly and, and efficiently, but it may not be the most responsible path forward. So uh, responses to the to the question? Sure, thank you. Um, you know, the United States already is very open in terms of the tariffs are very low for most of these countries. And of course, many of the IPEF countries, we already have free trade agreements with a number of them. So I think that one, this is a real experiment. And I think that's what's actually quite fascinating about IPEF. I don't think we know sort of ex ante exactly everything that's going to evolve through that. But it's a process, and it's a process that we are working with other countries um, to try to come up with how do we reframe and rethink the g regulation of globalization with respect to sustainability, with respect to social inclusion um, together. 
And so I think that's this is something which the reason why I, we do, obviously they had the first you know public hearing with their, uh, this morning uh, to get uh, some uh, some input on IPEF. They're going to have the first negotiations coming up. So much of this we just simply you know it's too early to to tell. But I, that's the way I would I would cast it. Is this is this is something which we if we actually it is hard to come up with how do we think about trade agreements. Um, in under this lens, because it's a completely different lens than has been used <laughs> for the last twenty years, right? Thirty years, and so, so it it is an experiment in progress. Um, so I, I, but I'm optimistic that by creating a, a mechanism to to work with other countries to do this, that it can be favorable. Then the final point is what's in it potentially for countries who are participating, and I think probably. That this idea of resilience, which means that we need to have global supply chains, which are not all based in China, creates an incentive for them to participate because they would like those global supply chains to locate within their own countries to a greater extent than present. Yeah, I would just uh, echo that I, I do think it's we're sort of in a very experiment, experimental moment, and there's, I think, a lot left to be seen and a lot left to be learned as to whether this type of modality for trade agreement uh, is uh, can even be called a trade agreement. Uh, you know, what does it mean going forward? I think that there's there's a lot, um, a lot to be seen there, but I, again, sort of given that our market is fairly open already, I think that it's kind of natural to think that this might be something, something like this might be what the next generation of trade negotiations look like. I think the other thing is that in the, in the years ahead, um, because of these resilience points that Jeff mentions, the, um, uh, that Greg mentions, the, um, there, there's going to be a lot more agenda. This is like sort of a framework for negotiation, uh, that a lot can be dumped into as initiatives come online, um, as some of these supply chain uh, re reshoring, French shoring happens. Uh, there's going to be pretty quickly a lot of carrots and a lot of money on the table uh, for countries that want to work with the United States uh, for the productive needs, uh, you know, across a few dozen different green energy supply chains. Um, and there's going to be a lot of economic opportunities there. And I think that to the extent that now it just sort of looks like a talk talk table or sort of some window dressing, I think pretty soon it's going to turn very, it's going to turn quickly into a world of specific factories, specific facilities, producing things for specific ends. Uh, and I think that in, in, in part, this conversation that the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, has provoked, where sort of the rest of the world saying, hey, what about us? Like, how do we fit into this? It's going to be sort of this dialectic where we kind of are going back and forth. Uh, and, and I think that that's going to be a generative dialectic where uh, we will start to have sort of very concrete areas for international cooperation become clear fairly quickly. So uh, like my colleagues, you're not going to find any of the three of us, I don't think, is going to push back very much on the substance of what's uh, trying to be done there, although um, I have uh, pushed back at least on the process through which this is occurring, and we could talk about that separately if you wish. But I, we're already hearing, at least on the trade pillar, right, you said there's a laundry list of, of U.S. priorities, um, which are very similar to U.S. priorities we've seen in other trade agreements as well, uh, with, with some additions. But so I, we've already sort of heard that the text we'll see in the trade pillar is very similar to what we've seen in other trade agreements. Um, and and I think, as, as others have said, it's not incentive-free, right? It's not that it, there's, uh, even though there's not the market access, and that's what many people point to, it's not entirely an empty vessel, right? There, we've heard different things about the possibility of aid, uh, among others. But, but maybe, frankly, maybe that's enough, right? Maybe this smaller offering is enough. And, and why would that be? It's because of this corporate accountability, again, focus. That is, it may be easier for countries to sign up for commitments where it allows the United States government to put pressure on their companies rather than the countries, the home countries themselves. I mean, that could be an incentive in itself. We don't have to go after bad company X working in our territory because the U.S. government is going to come in and take care of that for us. So that's not a, a, a complete answer, but it's a brief one uh, to, I think, what you're asking. I throw in one more point. Absolutely. If you just think about China and its Belt and Road Initiative, right, it, it really didn't include any, any market access provisions in it, but it had huge impacts with respect to trade and investment with respect to its neighboring countries, and that was, that was the, the point of it. And so I think that was really interesting what Todd said, is when to think about the IPEF not just in the traditional trade sense, but something which involves many different component parts, of one of which, some of which would be investment um, and sort of rethinking about how, how, you know, creating incentives 
for companies to redo their supply chains. Yep. And I'm going to also just two finger. <laughs> we're going to all, we're gonna yeah, all do it. Okay, great. Uh, I mean, I think to go back to Beth's presentation, uh, you know, at the dawn of the GATT, the International Trade Organization was, uh, was a framework under which countries could conclude commodity agreements, right? And I think that like we're going to see a return to that. We're going to have to, right? Where countries that produce and countries that consume lithium are going to need to come to international agreements, and uh, you know some of it's going to look like GATT, some of it's going to look a little different. But I, you know, I think that that's IPEF and some of these uh, you know uh, frameworks can be places where some of those commodity agreements can live. Yeah, and I and I I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I'm just go because ahead. I was glad that Greg raised the the China point. Um, as I was speaking about the corporate accountability, I, I don't it sound overly rosy, right? Because we could also point out uh, that maybe we are taking a page out of China's playbook, right? By going down this road, by cajoling companies in favor of what we consider to be U.S. Uh, values, in, in in that is in favor of a progressive cause, and how appropriate that is or not, uh, we could debate separately. But Jeff, go ahead. Sure. Um, there's a, a question uh, here in the middle of the room. Hi, thank you very much, Jennifer Hillman from Georgetown Law. Uh, fabulous panel, thank you very much. Just sitting and, and sort of thinking on, on all of this put together, um, I, I was, I'm very struck by, by basically what I hear from all of you at some level is this, if you will, failure on the domestic side. I mean, I'm going to start with Beth's comment, which I, I would certainly you know, share, is that one of the fundamental problems with the, you, when you think about the Ricardian theory comparative advantage is this presumption of labor mobility. And we've obviously seen, um, a, as she very eloquently put it, we don't have the level of labor mobility that would have allowed all of that. I think about a lot of what um, Greg was talking about in terms of this notion of having trade adjustment assistance that is always had been the sort of, if you will, quid pro quo. Uh, you know, and then come over, Kathleen. You're you're commenting on you know the hard thing to deal with is the workers at home. Uh, you know, so so I guess my question is. You know, how how do we do this, if you will, linking between trade policy and what we need to see on the domestic side? And my second question is, is this more of a U.S. problem? In other words, is this more of a – the United States is more of an outlier? Because I would certainly agree with Greg that some of this issue is the relationship between capital and labor. And clearly the United States, we have privileged capital far more than other countries. I mean, if you just – look at the level of income inequality. Um, we are far outpacing any other developed country by a very large measure in terms of how much um, income inequality we have. Uh, we are, we, you know, again, we tax capital at a much, much lower level compared to labor than most other countries in the world. So, I mean, we have created within the U.S. economy a much greater sense of of, of inequality, and we have been arguably much less able to provide that safety net, if you will, that worker retraining, that et cetera, et cetera, that would support the dislocations that have come as a result of trade. So I guess my question is, is this a U.S. only or largely a U.S. problem? And secondly, just how is it that we should think about linking trade and or trade agreements, and they're not necessarily the same, to what needs to happen on the domestic side? Uh, to support that worker at home, that community, et cetera, and to address the income inequality issue. Great. Great. Thanks so much for that. If I could just say one word on that, one thing that's especially compelling about, about the, the questions that you're raising is that we also know that the U.S. in some respects has a particular attitude toward the multilateral system in recent years and what trade law is supposed to be doing and, and whether the GATT WTO system, for example, is, is designed in a way that serves U.S. interests. And, and that, that policy position is, of course, related to some of the unique features of the, of the economic situation we might find ourselves in. But, but Sure. So maybe I'll take the second <coughs> question first and then the first. So thank you, Jennifer. So the, the answer the is, the is the U.S. you know alone on this? The answer is, I think, yes and no. I mean, Europe it clearly is, it does a much better job in providing. It started in Denmark, Flex Security, Active Labor Policies, um, where the government is very active in trying to help people relocate, retrain. Um, this then migrated to the entire European Union. We should learn from them, right, frankly, but it's difficult for us to do so. Um, but uh, that being said, Europe's facing these challenges too. You see rising inequality in France and Germany and other countries as well. They do a better job redistributing after tax than we do, but they still have these challenges. Um, 
in terms of the U.S. labor policy, I think that, the, and it's linked to trade, I think that one, I, the, the argument is since we haven't been doing the latter, um, we need to, and since liberalization does empower capital vis-a-vis labor, it's time to put further liberalization on check, and I would go even further. I would say that until we actually engage in, uh, in, in more active labor policy and, and social inclusion policies, that we might want to cut back further on liberalization. And that is, the GATT creates a framework for negotiating tariffs. The way we think about negotiating tariffs traditionally has always been in one direction, which is ever further liberalization, ever further reduction of tariffs. We can negotiate higher tariffs. The United States arguably should do so unless <laughs> it ha- to the extent that we see the major challenges with respect to social implosion today and grow- growing inequality, there are strong arguments then that we should actually be negotiating through the GATT framework higher tariffs um, as opposed to just lower tariffs given where we are today. And let me just say uh, to the panelists, we're just in our, in our final minute here. So if you would just like to say something by way of wrapping up. Yes, sure. Uh, you know, I think that a lot, this question comes up a lot in trade policy and politics, which is, you know, is the U.S. unique? Uh, you know, yes, the, these consequences flowed from liberalization, but could an alternative set of consequences happened had we had a more robust social welfare state, et cetera? And I think that the, one's approach to this to this question um, is sometimes driven a little bit by your disciplinary training, at least in academia, right? Where I think that uh, economists are willing to sort of assume all else equal, whereas maybe political scientists are more willing to sort of think that you, it's it's impossible to abstract from the institutions that we exist in. I think that you know we have the world's most counter-majoritarian Senate. We have a, a Supreme Court that's fond with nostalgia for the 19th century level of administrative state and hostility to environmental law. It's just hard to get things done in the U.S. So I think it, it would. It's I look at it somewhat pragmatically that we should be thinking about what's the trade policy that we can design to accommodate sort of the, the constraints that we have and what is the vehicle that you might get to accomplish some of those expansions of the welfare state and of the environmental law and to me uh, at least uh, you know I've come to come to think that that vehicle is more likely to be an industrial policy that then forces some of these questions and and gets companies and communities to sort of think proactively about how they want to be structuring uh, sort of a social welfare state for the next century. And I just have a slightly different spin, I think, on what you're saying, Ty. That is, um, I think your question, Jennifer, gets to this, uh, what is the meaning of trade? And, and, and frankly, the work that you're doing with erasing the end, I think, is, is, is central to that. There, there is a misconception, I think, to only see trade the one way, down path number one, to go back to my earlier remarks. But what's specific to the United States is that we are somewhat hamstringed, I think, by the trade administrative state that we have built for ourselves. That is, we have specific institutional mandates for our agencies that are working in this space. There is a degree of path dependence that is is built into the statutes that tell them what to do. And they are constructed in the image of this sort of one way path number one. So until we can break through that mold, it will be harder to do. Thank you so much. We're going to have to leave that there. Thank you for everyone who tuned in online and is in the room. Thank you to Kathleen Clausen, Todd Tucker, Greg Schaefer, and a special thank you in particular to Beth Baltzon from USTR. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jeff.